away from Israel. Amen. Stay away from it. All you people talk about converting the Jews. Before this message is over, you'll see it's thus saith the Lord by word and by spirit. Amen. Israel will be converted over the whole nation in one night. Amen. The Bible said so. Amen. But the gospel's not even to them. There's a few renegades that's out and so forth like that. They come in and outside of the main body of Jews, they come in and get saved. That's true. All right. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Cultish, Entering the Kingdom of the Colts. My name is Jeremiah Roberts. I'm one of the co-hosts here. I am here, as always, with Andrew, uh, my trusted psychic and super sleuth. How are you doing, man? I'm doing well, doing well. Just uh, trying to recuperate from uh, learning about the history in the last couple episodes about William Branham and Roy E. Davis. Yes, and we are continuing to go down the rabbit hole into the 1920s. Lots of fascinating historical events surrounding the involvement of William Branham, the message, the Branhamites, quite a crazy first two episodes. We are back here with John Collins. How are you, my friend? I'm good. It's good to be back. Good, good. I appreciate you coming. We'll come back and join us on. We had a blast in the first two episodes. Uh, and so what you just heard there, and we'll unravel this, was some very uh, kind of shocking when I first hear that. I mean, I don't get surprised too often here at Coltis because we've dealt with all sorts of interesting uh, topics and, and kind of audacious and uh, over-the-top claims about something. But that one kind of was, what made me take a step back and just said to myself, wow, that's a pretty audacious statement for someone to be a prophet of God. And we'll talk, the reason why we played that is we are going to unravel the origin, uh, the continued origins of where William Branham went uh, from after he established the Branham Tabernacle and established his relationship with Roy Davis. We will be interesting another uh, character in just a moment here. But uh, John, just real quickly, can you just tell everyone again where people can find you and if they want to go deeper? Because again, we're only scratching the surface as many episodes we're going to cover. Where can people find you if they want to look deeper into uh, the content we're discussing? Everything we're discussing is on william-branham.org. <clears throat> you can also find it in my book on Amazon, Preacher Behind the White Hoods, a critical examination of William Branham and his message. And you can also find me on the newsletters in Alternative Considerations of Jonestown and People's Temple. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yeah, definitely appreciate that. And uh, we're definitely excited to see how this transitions because given into the story of his connection with Jim Jones, given the initial research and episodes we did when we initially launched Cultus. So we're definitely looking forward to that. Oh, yeah. So uh, maybe you talked about this. Uh, the person we're actually going to talk about today is someone by the name of not Roy Davis, William but, um, D. Upshaw. Really, William D. Upshaw. Yes. Which just it just sounds like a name, someone a name that you would call someone in the 1920s. Yeah. You know, like hello there, I'm William <laughs> D. Upshaw, and um, yeah, but yeah, I could see him like with a snidely whiplash mustache, you know, with a tall hat, kind of looking as fancy and extra as you could during the 1920s. But he was a congressman, and what I found just fascinating just about some of the history. This is one. we we'll, I think we will find out is indicative of, of just the underlying worldviews that William Branham was developing with his influence with Roy Davis and his connection to the Ku Klux Klan. And again, and as you mentioned in the last episode, it wasn't just this sort of antagonism towards black, but it was also uh, towards uh, Jewish people as well, too, and, and others as well. So that's where I think some of the underlying tones came from. So we're focusing in for this uh, next part of this uh, segment on William Branham, on William Upshaw. So... Can just start from the beginning. Can you just tell us a little bit about him, uh, how he evolved, where he came from, and how did he could get connected to Branham and Roy Davis? I, I think that's really what surprised me the most was learning the deep roots that Upshaw had with the uh, with the story that's building up behind the scenes of William Branham. Um, Upshaw, interestingly, is is a person out of all of the people that I cover in my research that I almost didn't research mm. because he was, he was very much a supporter of the message, the cult that William Branham created. And like, like all of the other men that I came across that were very, you know, very supportive of the, the cult, usually the backgrounds are the, they're very similar. They're just men who are, you know, um, Pentecostals or Pentecostal supporters who 
were in the movement, in the healing movement, and they were looking to gain some following of their own. Upshaw um, followed William Branham around during the last years of his life, claiming to have been healed in one of the meetings. And I almost discredited the whole thing as just, you know, part of the stage act, right? Right. I didn't realize that he was part of the creation. <laughs> um, hmm. w- whenever I found out that, R- that Roy Davis, William Branham's mentor, was the one who introduced Upshaw in a wheelchair in one of the meetings to be healed. And I had just learned that Upshaw, uh, I had just learned that Davis was so deep with the um, white supremacy groups. I knew there must be more to the story if Upshaw is making, if uh, Davis is making this connection of Upshaw. Mm-hmm. So that's really what made me start digging in to, um, to learn more about who is William Upshaw. Okay. And so when, <clears throat> when Congressman Upshaw, when he went, was he a congressman at the time that he went in this healing service or did he become a congressman later on? He was not. <clears throat> so his, a, a broad spectrum of his history from at least the, the parts that I'm aware of until his death, Congressman Upshaw was, um, was uh, injured at a very early age and he spoke from a wheelchair and later on crutches in his uh, early years, but he became a a United States congressman in the, I want to say it was around the 20s, 1920s, and um, later he actually ran for president himself on the prohibition ticket. Hmm. Um, It was after that failed and he sort of disappeared from the scene for a few years that he, he basically reemerged with Roy Davis. Mm. Okay. <clears throat> Fasting. And so when he, so he went to a healing service with William Branham and that's where something changed as far as he had, a, was he, did he believe he experienced some sort of healing or was this something where it was kind of a psychosomatic thing or was it kind of one of those bait and switch things, which a lot of he- healers are kind of known for? Because uh, this is something, you know, William Bram didn't really grow up around a religious background. He was kind of fascinated by this, these whole aspects, and he was brought into this. Like, how did that, what was the nature of him being at the healing service? Well, so this was at a time whenever the, the message, as it was called back then, was it was more the latter rain message. Uh-huh. There were lots of you know, ministers from all over the world who were joining in <clears throat> to what was becoming the healing revival. And um, Upshaw himself was a uh, Christian evangelist. He was known as the Billy Sunday of Congress because he had speaking engagements, preaching while doing politics and, um, you know, mixing religion with politics while he was. Um, he was... He had been on crutches. He hadn't been on a wheelchair apparently since the like 1915. Mm-hmm. So the fact that he entered into this healing, this meeting to be healed in a wheelchair is a little surprising. Right. But uh, I don't. I don't know the specifics of what um, you know what the motive or intent was behind it. But I can see that there was a lot of publicity that happened because of it. Mm-hmm. Um, it it could be that he was part of the stage act, or it could be that there was more to the story. I just, I don't know. Yeah, there's a weird, like, dichotomy being presented in terms of, like, the stage persona or the creation of the healing movement with Branham, because it's been noted in the book that, that uh, Upshaw was actually physically caught running on the Congress floor. Right. Like, so, right. so it's not right. like he he literally was uh, stuck in a wheelchair. And when, when he, if he would have been caught physically running on the Congress floor, that would have been before he even met William Branham. Is that correct? Uh, yes, he was a he was a congressman, I believe, until like 1927. Right. Yes. And it wasn't until the 50s that he um, he came in and met met with William Branham. So, yeah. And, and I look back at just the medical science. Right. So if he was in a wheelchair in the 1915s and then I, I'm familiar with the article you're referring to, they, they said basically he was running down the Congress floor 
and his crutches were barely even touching the ground. Right. So people were questioning, are, are these crutches a prop? Why is he using these crutches? Well, I'm picturing a man who only needs crutches, who's entering in front of this audience in this wheelchair. And the thought that came to my mind was even different than that. Medical science had progressed enough where it would be very easy to put a brace on the leg. Mm. So even if he still had some sort of an injury, right, he could have stood. So there's there's a lot of things at play. Right. Potentially, maybe a, maybe there was some sort of injury, but a kind of an over a dramatization of the injury in order to gain empathy. And maybe that was a core part of his identity, almost in the same sense. I don't know. I'm just kind of shooting from the hip here. But, you know, you think about uh, Dan Crenshaw, who's the congressman out in Texas, and he was a former Navy SEAL. And, you know, he lost one of his eyes in a, in a combat injury. So he's kind of known as the congressman who has the eye patch, right? So that's kind of his thing. Right. Um, so I don't know. So maybe in the same way, is that an aspect too, where he's kind of using this foot injury, maybe as a way while he's in Congress to maybe have empathy towards people? It, it's possible. He had made, that's the other interesting part. He had made quite a name for himself as a public speaker and an author. Um since a very early age, he was nationally known, um, and people recognized him for his injury. Um, hmm. The injury, injury was a big part of his life story. So whenever he is getting these speaking engagements, it's about a man who had a, a very horrific thing happen to him, and he came back from that. So it, I can see that as part of his persona. Yeah. Hmm. So so how did um so Upshaw gets to this healing like tabernacle movement or but but how does he get there? So there's there's another character that William Upshaw meets and that's Roy E. Davis. He seems to be everywhere. How how did right. that relationship <laughs> develop between Upshaw and uh Davis? To to understand that, it would probably cover the next twenty podcasts. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I but. believe it. Davis is everywhere. But Exactly. But you have to go back to the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. So William Upshaw was a congressman in the state of Georgia. And Georgia was one of the first, if not the first, dry state. They, um, he, Upshaw was worked with the Anti-Saloon League. He was the vice president. He, um, he stood for a lot of things that I, in the you know, growing up in this movement myself, I would have agreed with all of them at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a very, very outspoken supporter of William Joseph Simmons, the leader of the Ku Klux Klan. And he was involved deeply with the Klan at the same time that Roy Davis was the spokesperson, the official spokesperson for the Klan. Oh, okay. So it's it's likely that they knew each other from, you know, back in 1915. Um, the earliest that I can really tie them both together is around 19, I guess that's 1917 or 18, whenever Davis has got his speaking engagements. Mm. Wow, fascinating. And so, yeah, it just makes me think about, too, I mean, back then you would have a lot because this is pre-civil rights era, this is right around, this is almost around the Jim Crow era, that it would make more, it would just, I'm sure there there had to be other people besides uh, Congressman Upshaw who had views like this. I mean, you think about, you know, a couple of years ago, he's passed away now, but there it was a Democratic senator named Robert Byrd, who historically, he was a member as well of the Ku Klux Klan. But it would make sense that, at least from my perspective, that at least during this time, know that this is just part of the normative culture to view uh, these sorts of things. And, and also, when you talk about the undue influence that a cult has, in reg sometimes in regards to a town, similar to when we covered the Church of Wells, how they may influence uh, you know different people, possibly even members of law enforcement who might be a member of the cult or possibly people on mm -hmm. you know the chairman of the board and, and such. So this is a situation where you have someone that holds these worldviews, and he was known as the Billy Sunday. Um, so how did? But he, it wasn't until the 1950s or so when the, when he met William Branham, right? So, right. Well, like, how is the connection? Because we're still kind of around the 1920s. Um, is there a point where these worldviews sort of accumulated leading up to the 1950s, or what? What's the? What's the? How do they mesh together? 
Well, that's that's really where I've been trying to dig and trying to see exactly how deep the connection runs. I can tell you how they met, and I'll I'll build up to that. There's some background you have to understand first. Uh-huh. Okay. But um, so these these two men, Roy Davis and William Upshaw, were in the Ku Klux Klan at the same time, and if you remember. It wasn't long after that that Davis was in Jeffersonville, Indiana, starting the church that William Branham took over. Right. So the, where I focus my research in the book, and I, I tried to go as deep as I could find information, was I, I knew that Davis was influencing, influencing William Branham. And I had stumbled across the fact that Upshaw and Davis were working together you know, earlier in the, uh, the early 1920s. So I wanted to know, were these two men also working together whenever they were with William Branham? And I came across this quote that is very interesting. William Branham, when he's speaking about, Roy, about William Upshaw and his meeting, he claims that he'd never heard of William Upshaw. And growing up and hearing this, I heard it many times. I never gave it a second thought because I had never heard of William Upshaw except mm-hmm. for, you know, except for this um, this religion. But whenever I started trying to research William Upshaw, I actually had difficulty because he was so well known that on any given day during his, almost his entire lifespan, there are articles from coast to coast about William Upshaw. Mm-hmm. He was that popular, that famous. So then I had to realize that there was there was likely an influence, whether it was directly or indirectly, there would have been an influence because Upshaw was he was in in these, you know, these religious circles. Mm-hmm. So I decided I was going to dig deeper and find out now knowing that Roy Davis is in the Klan, I wanted to know was Upshaw also in the Ku Klux Klan? Mm. Man, very interesting. Like the the web is just so deep. Yeah, you know, and it's uh, it blows it blows my mind. Uh, quite honestly, just okay. to just to hear how deep it goes. So, so in terms of William Upshaw and Roy Roy Davis, and even William Branham saying that he doesn't know who William Upshaw is, I feel I find like that's the big red flag in itself. Like claiming to not hear Absolutely. of somebody that everyone has heard of, there's a reason for it. What what do you think that reason is? Why why do you think Br- William Branham would say he has never heard of Upshaw? Well, in my opinion, which it's only opinion, I can't really say why somebody says right. something that is likely untrue. But in my opinion, based off of every other example that I had, whenever William Branham made a claim and it turned out to be false, there was much more to the story, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that really, that one statement is what drove me to try to make the connection. Why, why is Roy Davis introducing Upshaw to William Branham in the fifties whenever they were connected, you know, back in the early twenties. And that got me to digging into basically what created the Klan movement that would have influenced William Branham. And um, as it turns out, in the early 1920s, the Klan was getting a very, getting basically a black eye because of some of the more terroristic things that were going on. And uh, you played this quote um, right before the the podcast started about the Jews. Mm -hmm. William Branham saying the gospel was not even for the Jews. Right. Well. This was this was you know influence of the Klan. The Klan were also white supremacy group that you know they they looked at the Jews as not um, not at the same level of themselves, a different type of human, right? Mm. So I started digging into the creation of the Klan and and how Upshaw would have been um, how Upshaw would have been influenced by Davis in the early years. And I came across the story um, covered by several newspapers in the Los Angeles Times and, uh, you know, from Los Angeles to New York about the Klan, the congressional in- investigation into the Klan. And lo and behold, I found out that William Upshaw was 
basically the primary defense of the Ku Klux Klan before Congress. Wow. What was so? What was his defense essentially against Congress? <clears throat> well, the Klan had been, you know, turning turning towns upside down. They they were infiltrating the um, the government, the police force, and so there's a congressional investigation to try to understand what is this thing that's growing in the United States. And his defense was that it was a very, very patriotic thing that was growing. He, he referred to uh, William Joseph Simmons as one of the knightliest, most patriotic men that he ever knew. Wow. And <clears throat> when it came right down to it, his defense was actually quite brilliant. He said, if you're going to investigate the Ku Klux Klan, you also have to investigate every secret fraternal order, order mm. that, um, you know, that's in the United States. And he's speaking to a whole group of men who are in these things, right? Right. <laughs> so, wow. <laughs> it, uh, it basically halted it in its tracks. Mm -hmm. And just so you know, too, what, what state and in, in what state was William Upshaw a congressman? In, in the state of Georgia. Okay, that's why I believe I recall. And so, you know, we talked a little bit about the kind of the nature of certain things going on in Jeffersonville, Indiana, and the climate around there. And it's kind of this birthplace of all this syndicate crime and prohibition and all the, you know, attracting very notorious historical uh, bank robbers and a gangster like Al Capone. What was the nature, though, in Georgia? I mean, Georgia has a unique history in regards to some of the uh, racial tensions, you know, that had a huge influence, you know, building up to the civil rights movement. But around the time when he would have been uh, a congressman of Georgia, what, what sort of things were going on at that time uh, in the state when he was a congressman? During the during the time he was a congressman, actually, it's, it's one of the events that was the catalyst for the creation of the Ku Klux Klan. There was a Jewish man um, who was a... Uh, he owned a manufacturing company, I think it was, and a woman claimed that he raped her. And, um, you know, it, it was very questionable whether or not he did, but so many people rose up against him that they they locked him up and eventually they, they had a public lynching near oh, wow. Atlanta, Georgia. And... Um, they, I, I saw pictures of it in my research, which are, are horrific, but people were there taking photographs. They were making postcards, people standing by the man who's hanging from the tree so that they could get their picture made. It was this type of atmosphere. Wow. Upshaw was a congressman. And um, he was one of the, this this man who was, was lynched was one of the catalysts for the Ku Klux Klan because they saw his lynching as a patriotic act. Mm. They they saw this this mm. person who was a Jew who was in manufacturing who had, you know, he was getting he was giving Jews the jobs that they wanted to go to the whites. So this was a very patriotic event for the white supremacy groups. Mm. Which is crazy, man. I, this is this is very difficult. You know, this is heavy content about what we're talking about. Oh, I mean. Yeah. Again, I, I can only imagine, I, I don't know if I share this with you, John, like about, um, it was back in 2008, I was in Ireland, uh, just on a trip with my friends to explore the island, you know, pre-COVID when you could, and everything wasn't locked down, when that was actually reality for, for a lot of people. But um, what was, what fascinated me is that I have this unique experience, we went up to Belfast, and we when we went up there, we found out it was on a day called Protestant Day which was basically a day where the product, it's, it's very much a cultural thing as far as Protestants go, where they would build up these giant pallets, uh, wooden pallets and douse them in gasoline and they would put an Irish flag on top. And I hmm. remember being up there and I felt like there was this tension in the air when we were, I was up there with Belfast with my brother and my friend Matt. And I just remember that they were even telling the, the police officers up there with their yellow checkered vests were just saying, this is if you're a tourist, this is probably a, not a good night to be up here. This is Protestant Day, and we weren't quite sure what was going on. Needs to say, we started seeing all these giant multiple pallets of wood 
that were doused in gasoline with an Irish flag on top, and we knew that we are not we are not in Southern Ireland Ireland anymore. And you could feel the tension. And as we're driving back, I'll bet. as we're driving back, we see these billows, these firing billows all over the Irish countryside. Wow! And it was like, and there's one moment where you drove by this gang of hooligans that had this giant pallet that was of wood that was already on fire with the Irish flag on top. It was almost as if the Irish flag was fighting back against the flames. And mm-hmm. I just remember like you could just tangibly feel the tension or the hatred in the air that these people had. Mm-hmm. So it's almost as if I can only imagine that in the immediate point of reference I made, I can only imagine like living in the South or living in Georgia at the time where a movement like this is prominent and you go out there and you see a bunch of men in white hoods with the burning cross and doing everything that right. they do. And that's just immediately I just associated with with that. Um, so this is something that's fascinating, too, because I mean, we are talking again. This is this is part of American history. This is also a, a, po- a product as Christians. We have the ability to make a, a sense for why people would hate their neighbor without cause. Um, but. We mentioned in the last episode about how um, after the film was released, uh, around 15 men, men gathered around Stone Mountain, just north of Atlanta, to organize the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, very little is known about the 15 men who gathered that day. Um, and they were led by someone named uh, William Joseph Simmons. And so he was related to that, and it was, a, it was related to Birth of a Nation, which you talked about, that had a huge, it was one of the most effective works of propaganda and a no and this and it's an absolutely wicked and deplorable movie um you know i've only seen bits and pieces of it and that's literally all i needed to see uh, it was just part of american history so maybe just talk a little bit further about that and also uh maybe explain to you know william joseph simmons and how he connects how does he come into play with all of this going on and how does it connect to Upshaw and uh, Davis and ultimately Brandon? Like, how do those pieces all work together without having to do 20 podcasts? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, so I'll give you the, sh- the short version. Yeah. And you mentioned the, the burning flag and the, you know, the uncomfortable feeling that you had there. Well, with the burning cross, it's the same thing, right? They're burning the cross as mm. showing their patriotism, and they specifically chose a cross because they— believe themselves to be a Christian organization, but every person who's on the other side of this, that burning cross creates fear, and they yeah. they enjoy this fear. They enjoy the ability to give people fear, right? <clears throat> so this event that happened whenever Congress started investigating, it, you know, even though Upshaw saved the group from being fully dissolved, there was enough publicity of the bad things that were going on, the burning crosses, the killings. They were just slaughtering innocent people with um, no judicial system. They were bypassing all, all juries. And it's, it's not the American way, right? You can't have this kind of thing going on. Right. So the publicity alone was enough to get William Joseph Simmons ousted. He was... He basically had to step down as the leader of the Klan, and it became, at least my interpretation of reading the newspapers, articles, and the history books, it was like this scavenger hunt to see who could become the next William Joseph Simmons. Right. Mm. And what happened is the Indiana Klan is the one that became dominant across the nation. It was the one that basically was the largest force, and... William Joseph Simmons was ousted because Roy Davis was his public spokesperson. He was obviously ousted with him. And Upshaw somehow managed to come somewhat unscathed. Hmm. Most of the history books that I came across don't mention him as being part of the Klan. There are very little, there are very few articles in the newspapers even. I came across only just one or two that Apparently, during the course of this investigation, it was made known, at least according to the newspaper, that he was part of the Ku Klux Klan. Mm -hmm. But because it was dissolved and because he was close to Simmons, he was also out. So what happened 
according to what I'm seeing from the history, is that the Indiana clan became dominant. Simmons and Davis and apparently Upshaw were not happy about this, and they wanted to create another version they, a version of this. Um, you'll, you'll remember that William, um, William Branham was supportive of Roy Davis in the latter years, and Davis called his clan group the Knights, the original Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. It's referring to that thing that he had with William Joseph Simmons. Mm. <clears throat> wow. So, so here, here's a question for you. So, Will, William Upshaw, we know that he he knows Davis. Uh, there's the clan that they were all involved in. Uh, Roy Davis is a, a sketchy character. Or so, right. so is there? Are there times where? To be uh, very kind. To be very kind, yeah. <laughs> where where um, Upshaw was actually in danger of being convicted for crimes. Did he get into anything with Roy Davis to where he almost got in trouble for something? That's exactly where I was heading with this. Oh, so nice. Okay. Now that you understand the background of the story, right, you have to understand that Upshaw was just as much a part of this as Davis. Mm -hmm. If you don't understand that, you won't understand at all why he would be posing as a wheelchair invalid in one of right. these meetings, right? So you have the, this group of men who had something that they lost and they wanted to regain. They, they had this original Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. They wanted it back. <clears throat> um, shortly after, Davis was, he was extradited to, I, th I believe it was Arkansas, on charges of uh, grand theft auto. He actually served some prison time, and during the time he was in prison, I came across um, one of the there's there's a note of the the roster of men who are in prison, and there's a note beside Roy Davis that he's a sexual pervert. What? Um, <laughs> wow. He, he uh, you remember he had the he had the women that he would take across state lines, yes. and multiple wives, etc. Right. Yeah. So he gets in prison somehow gets out of this and he go he heads straight for Los Angeles, California. And lo and behold, William D. Upshaw heads straight for Los Angeles, California. <laughs> so I, I came across all this and the first thing that goes through my mind is there's a guy who's convicted of grand theft. Mm -hmm. He's been busted numerous times and somehow <laughs> wiggled out of it for Everything from swindling an organization, uh, swindling members of his congregation to stealing a piano for his church, um, to running around with women and having multiple wives. How in the heck did he get out of prison? Yeah. And when I see that here's Congressman Upshaw, who's connecting with him, I start to realize that these men probably have a lot more political pool than your average person who's in a Arkansas prison. Mm. Makes perfect sense. Yeah, and one of the things too you met, that I just want to point out too that uh, we're talking about all these different people who are involved in the clan and such, and and so especially when you talk about being a sociological infrastructure where it's hard to really speak out, otherwise you're kind of flagged or listed, is that one of the things you no you noted in your book uh, you talked about uh, says it said uh, to oppose the Klan and to be outspoken was very dangerous during this time. Uh, anyone could be watching or listening. It could be your neighbor, your coworker, it could be a Klansman. You'd better be looking over your shoulder because the politician in office, the laborer in a factory, the police force, anyone could be watching. Those who crossed the lines in the sand were drawn by the Ku Klux Klan were terrorized at night by men in white robes. Many were killed, especially those without white skin. So, just to emphasize, and you can give me your thoughts on this too. Like this is the when all this is going on, like this is the this is the sociological infrastructure of what's going on. So one, if you are, you know, part of if you're non-white, you are in further danger. I mean, like legitimately, because this is just a cultural aspect that's evil and wicked. But then if if you have problems with how they're conducting themselves, you don't really know who you can talk to, which is almost mm -hmm. It's almost like a cult within the culture as a whole. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Any, any, and, any and additional thoughts on that? Or? Well, especially if, if you're a person who's prone to getting in trouble, which we see with Davis, 
you also have you also have the political power to get people who can help you in any scenario, any situation, because you if you get before a jury and you're able to influence the jury, well, five of the 10 people, may, you know, maybe part of the Ku Klux Klan. You just don't know. Mm-hmm. So it's it was a very it was a very difficult time for people who wanted to be upstanding citizens because they're starting to watch as the as the judicial process was just basically crumbling because of these organizations and there was a lot of fear especially if you didn't have white skin Mm. well yeah and even too i mean you could totally change the scenario i mean if you if you are in a town that's taken over by a cult and you get arrested by the police officer who's a member of the cult and you are constitutionally you get a right to a trial by a jury but they are all under the influence of this a particular cult where they maybe there's a charismatic leader who believes he's talking to god well all of a sudden that right while the right to trial by jury is a biblical principle and it's derived from biblical law it's still it can only do so much if they if a bunch when it's run by a bunch of people who are fallen sinners in this case you know people who are uh, completely enslaved to this particular ideology of, of legitimate white supremacy in its formation in the 1920s. Um, so right. yeah, I definitely right. appreciate you saying that. Go ahead. I'll give you an example in, in today's modern world. It's difficult to picture back then because, you know, it's a different time, different place. Um, 2014, <clears throat> there's a William Branham message cult church that's in Zimbabwe. And this leader of this church, his name is Robert Gumbura. You can find his information on my website. This guy somehow convinced over 200 members of his church that he was the spiritual husband of the wives of the church and started sleeping around with the wives. He, he basically was able to convince husbands that he could borrow their wife on any given night. And... Believe it or not, that's not what got him in trouble, but the fact that he recorded their sessions together, their sexual encounters, the recordings is what actually got this man in trouble. And what happened was, after, during the investigation into this man, these women, this church, they suddenly realized that this person and this cult had invaded the political forces of Zimbabwe. They had put key people into the banking system so that if you were in need of money and you were part of the cult, you had favor over those who weren't part of the cult. And long story short, there's, there's enough here for another 10 podcasts, (laughs) but they, they were actually, they were actually trying to overthrow the government and almost did. It was a group of, um, journalist in the UK that accidentally stumbled on to the fact that th- these guys were actually arms dealers for the William Branham message cult. And they were trying to attempt a coup against President Mugabe. So this, the fact that you can have cult people embedded into the banking system, the police force, the government, it, it in fact, it, influences different parts of your life, but it impacts every part of your life Mm. from getting a loan for a house to the president that you might or might not have. Yeah. And just one thing out, it's funny. I almost misread, uh, a section of, of the chapter where you talk about, uh, uh, Congressman Upshaw, um, it said in September 1921, New York ran a series of articles and my brain was all of a sudden said during the, I almost thought during the New York, the World, <laughs> the series. World Series. I was thinking like New York Yankees. I'm like, wasn't New York Yankees like attacking the Ku Klux Klan for it? But, <laughs> um, but yeah, this. But in all seriousness, it said uh, according to the publication, the Ku Klux Klan had st- silently infiltrated America. Uh, infiltrated America. Membership had grown to over 500,000 members. The Ku Klux Klan had suddenly become a political and terroristic invisible empire, a force to be reckoned with. And entire governing bodies were now being control- controlled by Klan forces. And so it's very public, but at the same time is basically secretive. Um, and all of a sudden, you know, you had a, this Klan was now being exposed as you know anti-Catholic, anti-Jewish, anti-Black, you know, terrorist organization that was inciting violence in American cities. 
So, um, and that's directly connected to, you know, William Joseph Simmons. So it just, it's just fascinating to just see how this all ra- unravels together. Um, and yes, you are absolutely right. correct. I feel like we're 40 minutes in. And I'm like, yep, this could definitely be 10 podcasts. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm trying to give you the highlighted version. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so, so now that you have this background, right, you've got these men who are somehow getting out of prison. They're ending up in Los Angeles, California. So all of this sets the scene for how these two came together and what what can build a opinion of what an opinion of what happened, right? Right. So these these men get together, they lost the original clan. They just even based on the name, they wanted to recreate the original Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. So uh, Roy Davis started posing as a federal agent in diff- various social groups in Los Angeles and the surrounding cities. And William Upshaw, who just happened to be a former United States congressman, was backing his story. So this man who just escaped prison is posing as a government agent with his sidekick, the United States congressman, who says, yes, this guy can be trusted with your money. Wow. And they started getting people to donate for um, a children's orphanage that that they basically were creating as a front front for funding and generating and building their next plan of attack on the United States. The Ku Klux Klan called it the Americanization of the United States by spreading their agenda. Well, William Upshaw was in charge of the Department of Americanization of a children's orphanage. Mm. That just blows yeah. my mind. And it just and it makes sense, too, because what you'll see, too, in a lot of cults is that what they'll do is they'll have fronts where it's almost sort of like a honeypot or it, mm. it's just it, or it's an organization that's affiliated with it's not it's sort of obscure or not necessarily it comes across as not officially affiliated affiliated with Scientology for example so there's a lot of times when people have come out in criticism of Scientology there are organizations that are they're presented as human rights groups right, right. Um, mm-hmm. and they come out in criticism for example of Leah Remini or Mike Rinder when they did Scientology the aftermath of Lawrence Wright when he made the documentary and book which are both fantastic by the way uh, going clear Scientology in the prison of unbelief I believe it's called so a lot of times you will see sort of these organizations either as a media outlet um, as it as you know something of a neutral party mm-hmm. but they're really not um, so yeah, that, that's something that's always indicative of how cults will uh, run. That's, that's a typical playbook. And as we can see, this is back in the 1920s and people are doing this today. So yeah, there is nothing new under the sun sometimes when you look at how these no. cults are put together. Yeah. We also see two. Yeah, and oh yeah. Go, go for it, John. Go for it. I, I think I want to reemphasize something that you're saying and doing here. Whenever you're talking, you're referring to the cult, uh, whenever we're talking about what's happening here. I don't want people to mistakenly think that that's only referring to William Branham. The Ku Klux Klan itself is a cult, and there's many sub-sects within this cult, but it is a political cult in the same way that um, I, I, I personally feel like William Branham's message cult was a political cult, but some people view it as a religious cult. So you have to distinguish between the two. The cult the the word cult can infer and apply to both different parties. Mm, right. Well, that makes sense, too. If we even think about Jim Jones, it's definitely a religious cult, cult but it also had political uh, aims and views in ushering in a world of economic divine socialism. Right. So, or divine economic socialism. Right. I mean, it depends on the worldview behind the cult. So, it just, and, it, and it just goes right. to show in, in, in terms of uh, Upshaw, and Roy Davis, they've already conspired together, fronting through an orphanage to embezzle money to fuel something different. And it, it blows my mind that there can be people that try to have a front of some moral high ground, like an orphanage, right? Some place that takes care of children that don't have parents, but yet you embezzle right. money through it and you claim to be a minister of the gospel, yeah. Roy? Like, wow. It just blows right. my mind. 
you can't cloak well, sin and virtue. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, that's why. That's basically why I, in my opinion, the message is a political cult. Right. Well, on the surface, obviously, they're a religious cult. They're preaching. They're claiming that they preach the gospel, although they're unaware that the gospel was first to the Jews. And, <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> you know, it on the surface, yes, it looks religious, but you have to look. What is the motivation behind it? What mm. is the intent? What what is the train that this thing is riding? Yeah. And like you said, there there are a number of cults, and the Ku Klux Klan being one of them, that have several false fronts, not just faults in the in the way that um, it's a religious it's a religious premise for a political cult. But for instance, Roy Davis also in Louisiana had a front. The Louisiana Rifle Association, which was apparently the second biggest to the National Rifle Association, was the was basically the front that was funding his original Knights of the Ku Klux Klan in Louis in the state of Louisiana. So they went after children's orphanages, preschools, um, many rifle groups, guns and rifle groups. There, there are just a number of different facades for these cults to grow. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it reminds me of essentially of Jim Jones, one of his quotes where he said, and I thought to myself, how could I demonstrate my Marxism? The thought was to infiltrate the church. The same thing in the, in the sense with Roy Davis, uh, William Upshaw, and even William Branham in a sense, it's how can I demonstrate the white seed power of this genetic line? My thought was infiltrate the church. You know, it's just a different aspect of it. Mm. It, whenever you're speaking to, especially in this era, when you're speaking to people in a religious setting, most of them, you, you also have to remember, this is a time before movies and television were the thing today where it's you mm. know, 90% of your inter entertainment. Right. These people would actually travel for two hours to go hear some preacher preaching. And in these groups, they shut off all critical thought. Because they see the speaker in front of them is saying the word Jesus, they they think that they can just trust him, but that he's not have that he doesn't have some hidden agenda. Oh wow! But the religious platform was used by several malicious people, just to try to influence people who had shut off their critical thinking. Mm. Yeah, and that and that definitely is the case too. You know, there's a lot of church even there's a lot of churches organizations where as soon as that person gets up, it's almost that you're assuming. What they're saying is revelatory, and even if they're not being revelatory, they have that celebrity status. Yeah. Um. You know, there's a bill like, oh my gosh, I just get to seat, I just get to sit at his feet, right. you know, and just just hear every single word that that comes out, rather than looking at it, thinking critically, like our pastor or pastors. You know, when they get up, is that they always make the point that the Bible is the final authority. You need to test every single thing that I say by Scripture. Don't take my word for it. And so a lot of times when you have a culture that's like that, where it's just the focus is in on, on the celebritized pastor or someone who, who is a prophet who's speaking uh, for God. And if you're fully bought into that, I definitely agree for sure. A lot of that critical thinking goes down. Uh, so one of the things, too, so maybe as, as we kind of like wrap up here, we kind of bring all these different connections together. Given we're given the brief non 10 pod cast part overview of it. <laughs> so one of the things that's continuing as these connections are are being made with Congressman Upshaw, so you can, you have this uh, radical white supremacy that's happening, but also across the board, uh, you have the prohibition era that's taking place, which is affecting the closure of saloons um, and a bunch of different things. So you have, for example, and I just thought of this too, um, I can't endorse the show, but it, it, the, as far as what was premise in the, the HBO series Boardwalk Empire, you know, you had Steve Buscemi, whose character was this Republican mm -hmm. congressman who put forth legislation to advance the prohibition. You just call him Steve Buscemi? How does it pronounce? B Buscemi? <laughs> Buscemi? I don't know. Oh it's just funny. It's, been, sorry, it's, been, it's been a long day. Keep going, it it takes like th two or three months to I actually evolve. I wasn't going to call you out on that. Bushu <laughs> Bushumi. Oh, no. Well, it's not the first time it's pronounced something. I appreciate you not knowing me, but we're just going to roll the punches. <laughs> I'm but, sorry. So he played a Republican congressman, and what's interesting is that he, what he did is that when he passed legislation to end pro to uh, end out the distribution of alcohol, but then behind the scenes, he yep. was involved in the, the distribution of illegal liquor, leveraging the black market. 
So I guess my, right, right. I just couldn't help but think I mean, of the fact real mm, quick. And you can jump sorry, in here and give your sorry. thoughts, Andrew. Sorry, sorry. I see your brains go, <laughs> but this is how it is. We bounce ideas off of each other that I'm like, oh, corrupt congressman already has these crazy views, this weird religious figure who's faking an injury. Uh, there has to be something going on, too, with the prohibition era because it's all interconnected. So yep. what, what was right. your thoughts, Andrew? Yeah, I'll let John take it, take it from here. But in terms of, I mean, Upshaw, at the same time, he went somewhere else, even during the prohibition, to get alcohol pushed in another way, like a medical, alcoholic as, alcohol as a medical gimmick, right, John? Like, what did he do, too? Right. That, that's exactly what I'm sitting here. I'm I'm smiling. I'm I'm saying raising my hand. I've got some. I've got something. Yeah, get it, get it. <laughs> um, so so these these guys, right? So they're he's known as the um, he's known as the driest of the dry, as they call him. He's the man who won't touch alcohol in any way. And his second wife was also a prohibition leader from Los Angeles, who was in on this thing whenever he's posing as the FBI agent, when Davis is posing, right? So my, my mind immediately goes, well, are, are these guys being honest? Uh, was this guy really, did he really not like alcohol? Or was it also part of the stage persona? And I came across, as I'm, as I'm researching William Upshaw, like I said, there's, I want to say, 100,000 newspaper articles that I had to sift through just to find the good stuff. And I kept coming across this dang article on Sargon. And I, I kept, you know, I flipped through the page and here's Sargon, here's Sargon. What is this stuff? And I, I actually thought it was mislabeled. It can't be related to William Upshaw. And finally, I gave up and I just looked, okay, what is this thing? Oh, my gosh. This is the former congressman, William Upshaw, who's promoting this product, which is made with alcohol, called a revitalizer <laughs> that apparently you drink the stuff and it makes you happy. I, I can't, I can't say anything more other than it just doesn't make any sense. Right. Um, so I started digging in what is Sargon? Is it truly alcoholic? And apparently the Bureau of Investigation started looking into this because it was a fake, basically it was a magic elixir. It was a fake tonic put out by the G.F. Willis Company from Atlanta, Georgia, where Upshaw was from. We're pulling up images and, right now, by the way. <laughs> it, it was it basically the FDA came in and re misbranded, deemed it misbranded because they had so many fraudulent claims. And this was the basically this was the real life equivalent of that medicine man that you see in Bonanza who's coming from town to town with a bottle of whiskey mm. saying yes. this is snake oil and it'll heal you. <laughs> mm. Yeah, it def like I said, just looking at the image, it definitely looks like uh, something related to, uh, yeah, def it's definitely snake oil salesman with a label and the branding. I mean, you couldn't, I, I it, it fits the picture. It's not know? alcohol, it's alcohol. Yep. It's, it's like, wow. If the pictures it's fit, alcohol. you can't equip. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so but, but so seeing all that, and then so how did how did they all fit together? I mean, as we wrap up here with the prohibition era, with all these people interconnected, you know, and it's going to be a while before they meet Branham, but they're they're still in contact with other people that uh, Branham is connected to. Like, how does it all relate? Maybe as we wrap up, maybe we'll jump into the next episode. Um, another another key event, jumping back to Branham, was the. Chicago State Fair, and we're bringing that up too because there's a lot, there's a bunch of different historical events that we're talking about in the previous episode. And we talked about the Prohibition era, uh, the Great Depression, and how that affected the state of Indiana. But there is a point of William Brandon where he's still kind of figuring out the origins of his ministry and kind of figuring out the persona of William Brandon. That's still evolving in play. Uh, just maybe kind of lead people into uh, the Chicago State Fair and. Where did how did that affect William Branham? And as we wrap up here, like just kind of give people maybe a sneak preview of like what we may talk about in the next episode, or just where, what sort of influence did the Chicago Fair have with where the entirety of his movement went from there? William Branham is known as a prophet by several different groups, not just in the cult. You find these these 
shows like God's Generals, these books called God's Generals and the documentaries, and they're claiming that this man is a prophet and he's a Christian prophet. And it's interesting because when I left the cult, I read the Bible like, I want to say 15 times cover to cover over and do it again, do it again, trying to wash all this stuff out of my head. And as I'm doing this, I start to realize that wait a minute, these guys who are prophets in the Bible are, are prophesying of things that are related to the spiritual, that are they're related to cleaning up your life, salvation, etc. And I look back at my life in the cult, and William Branham was prophesying on things like cars that would be shaped like an egg. Hmm. And this thought suddenly struck me, what on earth does a car that's shaped like an egg even have to do with me? Why, why would God want to speak through this man to tell me that a car is going to be shaped like an egg? And to sum it up in just one sentence, the Chicago's World's Fair was basically the source of several of his alleged prophecies. <laughs> mm. Wow. Well, that, I'm sure that's uh, going to... Uh, I'm, I'm very excited to see how that unravels, obviously, because we know kind of we we know where Branham's story ends we know that eventually his connection and relationship to Jim Jones and how that started of the people's temple and the influence that it had was fascinating because again if you look at the entirety of Jim Jones's whole movement was was ba- it was based on the exact antithesis antithesis of Brandon's movement and the and Roy Davis, everything that they propagate in their early movement, they're so polar opposites in regards to this extreme white supremacy and the type of racial equality that was part and parcel was the core aspect of Jim Jones's message uh, through the divine economic socialism. So we're excited to see that how that unravels. So, all right. Well, John, we appreciate you coming on here. And as always, thank you all for listening in uh, to uh, this episode of Cultish. And, uh, yeah, we'll talk to you all uh, next time on Cultish. We're entering into the kingdom of the cults. Talk to you all soon.